All right. Um, I'll stop the class, I suppose. Um, uh, seeing that most people are here, I suppose. Um, for anything, I would start by. Well, first, welcome back to class. Uh, today will be our second session. Uh, it is going to continue to be one hour and thirty minutes, with a break of around ten to fifteen minutes in the middle. Um, here is the link again for the. Um, uh, for the sessions and today we'll be looking at uh, session number two more types methods conditionals sorry just gonna adjust the mic a little okay. and as per usual i'll share my screen Okay, cool. So before anything, uh, I would like to start off with a simple session one review of what we have learned uh, a few days ago when, on Wednesday or Thursday for some of you guys, I suppose. Um, and either way, um, first thing we, uh, we, took like, uh, we took a look at is types. Uh, there are a few types, but we're um, as I've said before, none of those like not all, not every one of those matters. And the four that matters the most is uh, boolean, which are just truth values, such as uh, that's all just true and false. Uh, there's only two values for boolean. Uh, int, which are integer numbers, such as uh, negative one, negative two, zero, one, two, three. Um, then we have doubles. Uh, they are uh, they're just real numbers. Uh, such as negative 2.0, negative 1.0, 0 0.1, 1.2, 2.6, stuff like that, uh, numbers like that. And lastly, we have string, which is just text, uh, such as this text, hello world, over here. All right, uh, and then we looked at variables. So the variables are just locations in memory that stores uh, some sort of value um, or some sort of data type. Um, and there are a few different types, um, and there's, for every single data type, there is a type of variable for it, I suppose. So you can have a variable that stores string, uh, such as the one mentioned below, and recall that for string concatenation, you could just do plus sign. Um, and then after that, we have uh, operators. So that includes arithmetic operators, which performs common mathematical operations, plus minus divide and modulus, or we have assignment operators, which are um, used to assign values to variables like a string A equals letter A. Um, or we have logical operators, which are used to determine logic between variables or values, such as uh, one equals two, uh, I mean, one is less than two, A is greater than B, and stuff like that. All right, uh, that sh should be all reviews for you guys. And, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, if not, I'll go over the homework. Okay. So let's take a look at the homework. Um, this homework should be, ooh, something like that. I'll fix the link later as, as per usual. Um, okay. So assignment one uh, is following an object, which is basically a simple th a question asking you to compute the position of a following object and print it out. Uh, and I give you one test uh, um, case, which is 10 seconds. Uh, well, one, ten, uh, one time is 10 seconds, initial velocity is zero, initial position is zero, and the final position should be negative 490 meters. Uh, it should be a double as well. Um, and here is the solution. Um, I don't think everything fits in very well. That's fine. Um, ignore the first part of it. All right. So, uh, should be simple enough. I believe I've provided a few examples of how you, you should set up the variables and initialize. This is a simple homework that tests you on how. Well, I just disconnected. Um, it's okay. Okay. As I've said, uh, this homework sh is just a test on the stuff we've looked at, including uh, assignments, 
uh, ooh, variable initialization, variable assignment, um, operators, and then print statements such as string concatenation and uh, basic structure of the code, which I've actually provided over here. So uh, first we initialize initial velocity as double, initial position as double. Uh, we initialize G, which is just gravity vector, um, gravity num uh, the gravity constant, mega 9.8. Uh, don't really have to care about the physics behind it uh, as I've provided all the, all the formulas for the, uh, for the calculation. Uh, and lastly, we have double position, which we'll be using to calculate the actual position. Of course, you could have just said double position equals negative, uh, equals 0 0.5 times G times time times time, stuff like that. Um, there's multiple, um, I should have mentioned this ahead of time, but there's always multiple ways to approach the same problem. Therefore, your solution might not match with mine. And that is not to say yours is worse or mine is worse. It's just that it's a perhaps different approach uh, that are equally valid. That being said, uh, lastly, uh, after plugging in the equation, calculating out the numbers, uh, we just print it out. Should be simple enough. Uh, if you do wish to get a copy of my sample solution, you could go to download, uh, download assignment, which you will have a clean copy of it. Uh, could just, ooh. one second. All right, there we go. Uh, yeah, uh, you could just, um, do download, well, control S, command S, and you can save it as a um, Java file. You could put it in your, uh, you could run it locally or upload it to Replit as we did before. All right, that being said, uh, this is assignment two, uh, which will be today's homework. Um, so as always, solutions will uh, come. Okay, so I've decided to put solutions up about a day before the next class. So in, just in case you want to check up on it, uh, check up on it before uh, the class starts or anything. Um, uh, sorry. Um, second yeah um homework two uh, i'll explain it further uh when we at the well, towards the end of the class i suppose so solutions to homework is uh, now done and i guess uh does anyone have any questions regarding the homework or any of the con review content i suppose i'll fix the link i promise <laughs> okay uh, without further, well, if, with if without any questions, uh, we'll start uh, our next session, I suppose, for formally start our next session. All right, um, so let's get into, well, let's take a look at a few more types, I suppose. Um, yep. So first we have something I'd like to in, uh, talk about before we int I introduce more data types or like, or variables. Uh, oh, um, yeah, if anyone, uh, although I'm not the actual host, I think I believe the host is uh, the Cloud Classroom. So uh, they have like account uh, specialized for it, but I don't think they will be here every single class to monitor it. Um, I could check up on it uh, if anyone wishes to have their presence. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll check in on them during break or something. Um, all right, that being said, I'll continue. So I'd like to talk a bit about divisions before we move on to more types. So division works a little differently for integers and doubles. So for integers, division is integer division, uh, which just means that you would only get a integer result. Uh, with that, well, what that means, I'll explain further uh, later, uh, just in a bit. And then for doubles, uh, division is float point division, which floating point division, which means that it will return a decimal and return a, a result with decimal places. And that is have to that's something having to do with uh, whether the data type is integer or double. If it if the division being done on well, if the numbers that are being divided are integers, that means the result will be integer as well. 
So there will, uh, it's always going to be whole num uh, going to be numbers like one, two, three, four, five. And then for doubles, uh, if there's any division between doubles, it would always return a double, which is like 1.1, 1 1.0, 1 1.375, 1 stuff, like that, uh, stuff like that. So here are a few examples. First, we have, yeah, first we have, um, let's take a look at this part first. 5.0 divided by 2.0. So if I divide by 2, simple enough, I hope, um, 2.5. Um, and that would be stored as a double. So A, because A is a type double. Um, therefore, A is going to be 2.5. Uh, it's uh, doubles divided by doubles. Therefore, division will return something with decimal places. And then we have integer, uh, we have integer division, which is what I've mentioned before. Uh, as you can see, 5 and 2 are both integers in this case because there's no point 0. Uh, therefore, the Python code, is, uh, Python assumes that it's going to be an integer. So 5.5 5 divided by 2. Uh, Normally, it should have given you two, two point, uh, like logically, it should have given you 2.5. However, because it can, uh, because it's integer division, you only take the integer portion of the results. So, five divided by two, uh, is actually two. Um, similarly, four divided by two will be two. Um, six divided by two will be three. Seven divided by two will be, uh, three as well. And Lastly, we have something in more interesting over here. Uh, although we have to fight about a two, which should give you two, because we are uh, because C is a type double variable is um, a variable that stores double uh, data uh, data type of doubles, it is automatically converted to two point zero. So two is actually converted to two point zero. Uh, they are the same number except one is integer, one's double. Um, have, so one um, A and C are different because five point uh, one uh, because the uh, A is dividing uh, what is it? Uh, A is dividing doubles while C is dividing integers and that's a main that's a very key point that's a key point to mem uh, remember about divisions that which is that divisions have different operates differently on integers or doubles which will be important if you're doing calculations or any uh, and uh, in programs like that. All right, so now let's move on to type mismatch. So type mismatch happens when you are assigning a variable uh, with uh, when you're assigning some sort of value to a variable of a different data type. So over here, we have a few possible errors. The first one is um, when you're assigning some sort of number like integer or a double to a string, which is well, it doesn't work. Uh, simple as that. Uh, if you would wish to store it, a stores a string of type 5.0 by using the number, uh, I'll mention that just a bit later in casting, which is 2.2.3 actually. Uh, so not too far. Um, and then the second version is when you're casting a string to a double. Of course, that also wouldn't work just because well, you can't really store string uh, like text as a number. They operates a little differently, uh, as you might expect. Uh, and then we have storing 5.0 as an integer. Uh, this is also not correct. Well, this also can't work because uh, float, uh, I mean, doubles store more information than integers. Therefore, if you're converting, uh, therefore, if you're storing 5.0 in integer, uh, like maybe number 5.2 integers, you cannot convert properly, uh, I believe. Yeah, so that would be, okay, yeah. And here is the possible error mess, the error message that you are most likely to see, uh, which is uh, incompatible types found some sort of data type, required some sort of data type, and then give you the line which the error occurs. Uh, we could do a simple test by using our Trusty Repler. And yes, um, I will, I forgot to post the instructions for creating a local IDE. However, I will get to that uh, after this class. Um, Um, 
Oh, I spelled mismatch fine. That's okay. All right. Sorry, trying to multitask over here. Um, public data void name. All right, uh, let's do a pretty simple one. A equals fucking zero. And that should, by the way, throw an error. See. Yeah, uh, I'll send the link to this replit again in case anyone misses it. And then this page as well, just in case. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't know if this even passes compiling. I think it's a, yeah, there we go. So type mismatch Java 3, uh, error, incompatible types, double cannot be converted to a uh, string. I don't know why it's cut out over here. It should say string. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, so um, simple enough. Same thing over here, double. equals hello world. I try compiling that. Uh, it should also, oh, it should just throw some similar issues. Yes, there we go. Um, string cannot be converted to double. Simple enough. However, there, this is where stuff gets a little more interesting. Um, like it makes sense how you can't convert uh, strings to doubles or doubles to strings. However, you can also not convert, as I've said, you cannot convert doubles to int. However, you could convert, convert uh, int to doubles just because uh, doubles store more information than int, as you might expect. Uh, one, only throw, uh, one only stores like whole number numbers or integer numbers while the other one actually stores um, stuff after the data uh, data uh, after decimal point therefore this one runs just fine uh, that's something called uh, that's something I would uh, talk about in right now I suppose actually all right so now if you uh, so this is something oh yeah uh, this is something called implicit casting. So uh, although you are not actually, so casting is a fancy term for saying, I want to convert um, between data types. So I want to convert a integer to a double, a double to an integer, a string to a, uh, I don't know, like double an int to a string. And sometimes Java handles that for you, especially in this case where you're, where you're automatically, automatically converting integers to doubles, um, something you don't really have to care about. However, there are a few times where you kind of have to take uh, care about it. All right, so which is over here. So first, this is just this is an example of implicit casting. Uh, integer can uh, two can be stored in a integer variable, but it can also be stored in a double variable as two point zero. The point zero is automatically automatically added by Java. And then, well, there should be a space for for some organization sake, but that's all right. Uh, we can have int a equals 2.0. Well, we can't have a equals 2.0 because it's an integer. However, you can be converting, you could implicitly, oh, well, you could explicitly or like manually convert doubles into int by using parentheses than the data type you wish to convert to. So if you want to convert data type into an, so that's basically tells Java, to treat whatever follows as this data type. So it's so in this case, it's telling Java to treat 
as integers. And in this case, you're saying to treat two. Okay, yeah. And if I would say like a double parentheses, double five, that basically says, tells Java to come, uh, treat five as a type double. All right, so there we go. Uh, we're wrapping back to divisions. So as you might expect, um, remember how integer division works. Q divided by three has a integer part of like integer result of zero uh, because it's 0 0.6667 like that. Uh, however, if you convert, well, if you treat uh, the integer two as a double, then it becomes 2.0 divided by three, which is a uh, floating point division which is, if you call it, it's just divisions with uh, decimal points. Therefore, you are able to actually get a more precise number out of it. All right, um, so the, uh, of course, there's a few more uh, other types of data conversions. Uh, a few more that are not as, uh, not, not as, I guess, intuitive. Well, it's fairly intuitive. Uh, just trying to open it up. All right, um, let's see. All right, uh, we'll start with, um, all right. Let's start with int. So let's say I have the number 5.0, well, five as a string. And I wish to, have it become be stored in a integer version. How would um well of course you can't just int s int equals uh, just a terrible naming convention, but that's all right. Uh, well, this should just where oh, I should have a different file should I? It's fine, I'll take care of it later. Um, All right, There you go. Uh, string can now be converted to int because, well, Java just doesn't understand how to. Uh, so there's something you could, a trick that you could do. Well, not a trick, it's a, uh, something that is uh, more, more or less the correct way to do it. Uh, and that is integer, uh, well, there are two ways actually. Integer parse int, then you could pass s into it. So what this does is basically, it, this is a function, basically. Um, so I'll talk about what dot, uh, dot extension is, but that's fun. I'll get to that later. Uh, in probably session four, I think, but just treat this as a function. Um, so basically what it does is it parses, parsing is just a fancy way of saying like extracting or getting the integer from the string. Because five is a, well, because we know five is actually an integer, we could just do this, and then a would be assigned the value of five. Uh, just dot uh, in, and there we go. So you could actually see it. Um, five. So now Java runs without an error. Um, similarly, you could do something like int a, okay, well, int a2 equals, um, there's something similar, which is uh, integer dot value of. Uh, these two work similarly. Um, intuitively, value of basically takes the value of the integer. Um, now, if you, if I print both out, they should give me the same thing. Uh, Oh, 
Oh, I spelled it wrong. It's awkward. There we go. Mm. Yeah, there we go. So both are fives now, as it should be. All right. So that should be simple enough. However, let's say I have. So this, a similar. Um, this also works with, uh, doubles. So let's say I have five twenty one. Well, this won't be doubles anymore, but. Well, this won't be int anymore, but it works similarly. Parse double. Uh, let's see. I don't want to take anything. Oh, they may be. All right. Uh, then double dot value of. Uh, Two. Now both of these should give you five point one. Uh, if I typed it correctly, but oh, well, that's two, I guess. This is this is a terrible naming convention. Do not name your variables as two, b one, b two, a one, a two. It's just for simplicity's sake. Uh, yeah, so, but anyways, uh, the main point is here. Uh, now it works. Uh, so this is just something how, uh, this is just a way how you could convert uh, strings directly to doubles or integers. And of course, this would throw an error if it's 5a or 5.1, well, 5.12 would actually work, but 5.1vc. If it's not all numbers, then it's, well, not gonna work. There we go. Yeah, so for string input, uh, for int in string, uh, for int string, uh, it's not an uh, it's not an integer. It's not gonna. Uh, the function, uh, the function cannot handle extra, uh, characters that are not, uh, numbers or dots. Something just to note. All right. That being said. Uh, we are done with two point two, which is just a, a bit more types. Uh, well, a bit more on types, including type mismatch, divisions, and casting. Does anyone have any questions regarding this? Regarding anything we covered this session or last session? Fun. Okay. Without any further questions, uh, well, with, if without any questions, we will, sorry, it seems like my Zoom is a little frozen. Um, I'll, I'll reconnect, I guess. Oh, never mind. It's fine. Cool. You know what I said. And, okay, 2.3. Um, so, I like, so uh, methods are just, well, we actually kind of have touched up on methods. So regarding the most basic method, a method is a block of code, which only runs when it's called. So that is like, uh, I'll show you with examples uh, later on. Um, so you can pass data known as parameter, uh, parameters into a method. And if you define the code once, you can use it as many times as you wish. And methods must exist within a class. I'll mention what classes are are in later classes. I'm not sure which session I'll mention it in, but something just to note that because Java is a program, well, a uh, program language that heavily emphasizes uh, op, uh, OOP, which is object-oriented programming, uh, all methods must exist, in, uh, exist within an object or a class. And below is the most simple structure of a method. This is actually the class, ignore it. 
uh, this is the function uh, function itself. So you have static void my method uh, parentheses then brackets, and the brackets is where you would put the uh, code to run. And in order to call the method, you would simply type my method parentheses uh, open open ending parentheses then a semicolon. No. And my method is the name of this method. Static, static just means that the method belongs to the main class and is not instead of the object of the main class. Uh, trivial stuff for now. Uh, void is somewhat important. It means that this method does not have or well, does not actually have a return value. That is, it's not like sending anything back to the uh, place where it's called. Now I'm going to explain that with a few examples, as you can see over here. All right, uh, let's look at the easiest. Well, let's look at a rather simple code, uh, newline.java. Uh, I'll copy this and explain it over here. Oh, it's called new lines. All right. Java C is a Java. All right. So before I'm gonna before I run this, I'd like to uh, walk you through the uh, use code first. So here we are with two methods or functions, whatever you wish to call them. Uh, I believe they're called in methods in Java, functions in Python, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Um, so the first one is called new line. Simple, uh, it just prints a new line and that's it. Uh, and the second one is three lines. It's just to print three new lines. Uh, then, so basically it calls the new line function, which is this function, well, this method. Sorry, I'm mixing up the terms, uh, but that's okay. Uh, so what it does is print a new line. So think of this, think of this line as all these lines combined. Well, in this case, it's just one line. So every time you call new line, this, uh, this piece of code is run. And so I called it three times, it's gonna print three new lines. All right. And then we move on to the uh, main method, which is, uh, which is main, I suppose. Um, so first we print, uh, we print the first line by using uh, system uh, system dot out dot print line. Uh, and then we call the method three lines, which is this method. And for whenever we call this, all these code are run once, exactly once, and then because we're calling new line, this line of code is, uh, ran, or is uh, ran once. So basically what this is, is a system dial. Uh, so this line, uh, line six printed a new line, uh, like the code line seven prints another new line to the console. Uh, line eight prints the third uh, empty line onto the console. This is called the console. Um, and then after, that line 13 is now finished ex has now finished executing um okay and then uh we move on to line 14 which is when the second line is printed so i'm going to run this and see how it actually works there we go as you can see uh there are a total of three lines uh, three empty lines between the first line and the second line and each indicating these three functions which is this? Uh, does anyone have any questions regarding how just this simple fun uh, this simple code works? Uh, like how functions work, why three lines are printed instead of one, or why one lines are printed, three lines are printed instead of nine, stuff uh, stuff like that. Um, yeah, feel free to ask. If not, I'll move on to parameters. Cool. Okay, uh, 2.3.3 parameters. So 
of course, some methods require some sort of input in order to be more versatile or another word when you can use in, uh, in multiple situations. And to do so, we have uh, parameters, which are just datas that are passed in from uh, where it's called. And then it can be used to, uh, well, then the data can be manipulated by the code below and it does uh, and do something with it. So let's look at square.java. Well, I don't want to run it first. That's okay. All right, let's take a look at this function. Well, look at this uh, piece of code over, over here. Um, okay, let's start with the main method. So first of all, it's starting with, um, well, let's see. Uh, yeah, so line seven. Okay, so main method. Okay, uh, the function, the method main is a very special uh, method. So Java automatically runs this piece of uh, runs this method on start, so you don't actually have to call anywhere. Therefore, line six would always be ran. So, whatever, whatever, whenever a function is called main, it would always be ran, and that is why, like in session one, concatenate, we have the main method over here. We don't, we didn't call it anywhere, but we are still able to get it running. Same thing, do math, um, do math two. Uh, hello world. Notice how the main function is always here. Uh, same thing over here. Although we defined three uh, methods, only this method, the main method, is ran on default or by the Java program. If I don't call it, it wouldn't. Uh, if I don't call uh, three lines or new line, it wouldn't have ran at all. So that is something you notice. Therefore, we would we could we would always start analyzing the program by where the main method starts. Well, uh, it will be different later on, but this is this is how it is for now. So we have int value equals two, uh, and then we're putting square. All right, so number eight, line eight, we're passing in the variable uh, value into the function. The variable has a value of two. Therefore, the value two is passed into print square. All right, so let's take a look at what print square does. So over here, we have int x. So what that is, it's just that it's going to take in a integer and store it as number x. Well, then it's going to store it in the location x or in the variable x, I suppose. And then that is, and then we move on to line three, which is since now dot print line x times x. So remember how x is actually just, uh, well, I shouldn't use this section. Um, so in this case, X is two. So we're printing out two times two and we're just printing out four. As you can see over here uh, in the comments, print square, that would print four into the console. Now we move on to print square three. So, three is passing it into this function number uh, on line two. And then therefore three times three is uh, nine. There we go. And then lastly, we have, uh, now we're done with executing with the, uh, executing the function. We return back to line, well, we were at line nine. So therefore we're now at line 10, which is two times the value. I re recall that the value is actually two. So basically you're passing two times two, which is actually just four. So uh, while four is passed in, four times four is just 16. Therefore, 16 is printed by line three. And uh, there, then we're done with line 10 and we move on to the next line, which is the end of the program and we're done. So this is uh, after how we ran it, as you can see, four, nine, 16, just as expected. 
and just a quick extension, I suppose. Uh, after this, we'll take a break. Um, you could always okay. Well, you actually can't do it over here, so never mind. Um, I'll I'll talk about it when we have return values involved. So, does anyone have any? Okay, now we're done with uh calling functions with a parameter. Oh, uh, with some sort of parameter. And okay, one thing, one more thing to call it to call the method. You just do a uh, method name parentheses then a value. The value must match the type. So like the variable, the data type of the value passed in must match the data type that is defined uh, in this method. Okay, I'm done now. Uh, well, for now. Uh, yeah, so let's come back at 55. And well, before that actually, uh, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask now um, regarding everything, anything we have covered? Um, all right, I'll take that as a no. And so let's take a quick 10 minute break. Uh, let's come back at 57 actually. Just, uh, yeah. Cool, uh, feel free to get water or something. I'll be here to answer any questions uh, through the chat.
All right. Um, it's 57. So that was about 10 minutes of break. So if you would like to, please, well, please come back now and we'll get started to finish up the last bit. All right, so previously we just talked about parameters, uh, passing parameters, and here are a few things, or a few common errors that you might see. Take a look at square two and think about, maybe think about why it couldn't work. All right, should be should be easy enough, I think. Um, as I've just previously mentioned before break, take a notice that the data type must match between the parameters and the values passed in. If not, it's gonna throw an error. Um, the same thing goes for square three. You cannot pass an integer to a well to a double because it is not a double. Yeah. Um, same same thing over here. You cannot pass int uh, a double into an uh, int field or a string into an int field. All right, so let's take a look at multiple parameters. Uh, and this is how you would be dealing with multiple parameters. Uh, first, it will be uh, everything is the same except that you would separate the different types by a comma, such as over here a multiply dot Java. So over here, we have double X, double Y, you pass. And so if I pass times um, two comma three, uh, you also separate it with a uh, comma, by the way, uh, for calling like the method. Um, so you pass in two and three, two goes to X, three goes to Y. Notice how that, that, that has to match as well. You can't have, uh, you can't, uh, so like, if I have double X int Y, you cannot pass three comma 2.0 into it. You have to, it has to be 2.0 comma three, just because that the position of each variable is fixed. Um, yeah, that being, uh, that being said, uh, okay. Uh, gonna be a second. There we go. Okay, hope that works. Uh, um, yeah, uh, let's see. Cool. Um, yeah, as I said, positions have to match. Uh, therefore, over here, we have two comma three, two goes to X, three goes to Y. And that gives you two times three equals six. It's gonna print six, four times five, print 20, six times seven, point 42. Simple. Um, now we have something called uh, return values. That is when you return, and that is when there is a return statement. So return statement is used to return a value from the method to where it's called. Um, as I said, void means this method does not have a return value. Otherwise, you would print, you would define the type right in the uh, declaration of declaration of this uh, method. So moving on to square four over here. We have public static, no longer void, but double square. So now we know that it's gonna return a type double. And then square, you take in a number called X. Over here, we have square five. So square, what, uh, what square five is? Should be, uh, uh, no, square 5.0 actually, I suppose. Um, that is when you are printing out 25.0. And 25.0 uh, is what this equation is basically. So you could treat, uh, so this is replaced with 25. So you're basically printing out the number 25. Um, similarly over here, uh, square three, that gives you nine, uh, well, 9 .0. So res double result equals um, the number stored. Uh, well, the number that returned by square, which is uh, three, I mean, nine, sorry. So therefore result is now nine and nine is printed. Cool. Uh, 
I kind of went over that pretty quickly. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. If not, I will move on to variable scope. Cool. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's move on to variable scope. So the scope of a variable is the part of the program where the variable is accessible. And variables only exist within the block or the uh, curly brackets they're defined in. So let's take a look at scope uh, scope over here. Uh, we have print square in X. Um, sorry, just checking. Okay. Over here, we have, well, let's take, first take a look at the main method. So we have int x equals five. So what x equals five, uh, or you have x equals five, therefore, and I'm gonna print out the value over here. Print, uh, I'm gonna copy this actually into our report. All right. Um, well, actually, let's take a look. Oh, I'm missing a return. Um, void. Yeah. Uh, if the uh, if you don't return anything when the uh, uh, you have something to uh, like it, when you're defining to return something, you would throw an error like this missing return statement. Anyways. Okay. There we go. Let's take a look at why the five is printed. So we have main x equals x, x is five, should make sense. Uh, therefore, this line is printed. Now we move on to number line 11, which goes to line two, line three, line four, and line five. Uh, we have number five passed in. Although this is also, an, although this is another x, it is a different x from the main method. It's a method that, uh, X over here only exists within the uh, method print square and nowhere else. So, and it's not linked to any variables. Uh, so this X has nothing to do with this X, except that they hold the same value. So you print X and then I remember how this works. Uh, you, it, which it, this is another way of just saying X equals X times an X. And then you print this out. So this should give you five, five it should give you 25, That's just like over here. And then I'm printing out the main X again to check if it's changed at all. And you see that it's not changed. Therefore, I know that when I change values, um, variable X inside of this function, uh, inside of this print square method, the number in the main method or the parent method or the method like in other methods, would not change be, uh, just because that some sort of value changed in uh, one of the methods. Uh, this is important because the, uh, this helps you to keep track of the how the program works and whether that there is uh, whether a number has changed or you have to like change it yourself. However, the, uh, sorry, one more thing to mention: there is a way to change it. Of course, it just goes like this. Return x. All right, and now I'm going to reassign x to print square. Now what this will do is that the value twenty five is going to be printed uh, while assigned to this x. Therefore, oh, oh, it should be double. Um, this this could be an int. There we go. Yeah. Uh, anyways, I was saying twenty five is um assigned to the main method x. Therefore, x is also going to be 25 now, as you can see over here. Just something to notice. Cool. All right. Um, this, this is another important concept I'd like to mention, which is abstraction. So complex programs are built from simple methods. And 
methods can be like, as you might see over, uh, I can show a few examples of complex methods next class actually. Uh, well, more complex programs that are made of more simpler methods. And methods can be individually developed, test, and reused. So you could write a method and then test it with some other, with some test cases manually inputted to make sure that it works before you put it into your main program. This ensures that this ensures these the least amount of bugs that uh, could exist, and makes the program easier to run. Um, that said, okay. Uh, that said, use uh, this is um, methods are also created. So users of the method does not need to know how it works in order to like actually get the perp uh, get it working. I suppose. Um, you can uh you don't need to know how like system dot out dot sprint line works, but you can use it how like you can use it in your method without knowing how to how it works. And that's the I guess a uh, beauty to uh methods, which is uh the level of abstraction. So which is an fancy way of saying uh well there's not it, there's not a uh other definition, I suppose. Uh yeah, the definition of abstraction is just how you can, uh, how each piece of the program is working, uh, working individually, and then you could play, uh, you can make use of methods that are pre-written in order not to repeat what you have, like pre, uh, repeat existing code. Uh, well, that was a. Um, that was it for two point three, I believe, which is uh. Uh, 2.3, which is methods. Does anyone have any questions regarding returns, parameters? Uh, abstraction is just a concept that you should probably uh, know about, but it's not anything of serious importance. Uh, oh yeah, scope is also something that gets a little confusing uh, with the, uh, when you have a lot of like uh, blocks within each other. And if no questions, if there's no questions, I'll move on to conditionals, which is the last topic of, which is the last topic of the day. So let's start with if statements. Um, so if statements are only ran when a condition is met. So if condition, so the structure goes like, this, goes like this, if condition then brackets, which uh, with the code inside the brackets to be run. Simple, uh, simple, uh, simple method over here with if statement. Uh, if x is larger than five, print x is larger than five. Um, when we run test six, all it does is print. Uh, it so x is now six over here, and then it's checking if six is larger than five, which it is, and it's going to print out x is larger than five. And if we put five, five is not larger than five. Therefore, the thing is ran and the method ends over here. Lastly, we have test four, which is also not greater than five. Therefore, the thing is ran and only a one line of code is, uh, one line of text is printed. All right, let's take a look at more a more practical use of this. Uh, one case of it is absolute values. So simply put, absolute values is basically taking the positive part of a number. Negative one, uh, absolute value of negative six is six. Negative absolute value of negative six, what? Sorry, negative uh, absolute value of six is six. Negative uh, absolute value of negative six is also six. Negative absolute value of uh, negative seven is seven. Absolute value of negative 3.2 is 3.2. Neg uh, absolute value of 3.2 is just 3.2 as well. So simply put, simple enough. Uh, and this is also done. This is how it's done. So we have a absolute, abs, short for absolute. Uh, if we take the absolute value of five, it's going to check if x is less than zero. If it is, it's going to return a negative x which is going to be, uh, well, actually uh, five is not less than zero. Therefore it's gonna go into the else statement and return just X, which is five. However, if I pass in negative five, 
x negative 5 is less than 0, therefore it's going to return negative negative 5, which is just positive 5. So just small use case of how you would be using uh, absolute values. Here are a list of the comparison operators again, uh, equal equal, which is just equal to, remember the one equal sign is an assignment, therefore you cannot do x equals y to check if they're equal. Uh, Python, um, not Python, uh, Java is going to throw an error saying that you can uh, throw some sort of error telling you that you cannot do x equals y in if statements. Uh, this is exclamation point equal is not equal, large, larger than, less than, larger or equal to, less or equal to should uh, be all right to understand, I suppose. Logical operators is useful when you're chaining a few if statements together. Uh, that includes and, and, uh, and, or, or not. So over here we have, uh, if x is larger than six, and if uh, if x is larger than six, if x is less than ten, when x is group between six and ten, you could chain it together by saying if x if x is larger than ten and x is less than ten, therefore x is between six and ten. All right. Um. All right, we're almost done. Um. Okay. Now, if else statement, I kind of covered this in uh, absolute value, uh, the code absolute value, but we could talk a bit more about it. So uh, else statement only, uh, so we have this standard if statement, and then if we want to have another condition, so like to have two branches, one is works only when it's true, one works only if it's false. Um, so over here we have code to be executed if condition is true, which is under the if statement, else if it's the condition is false, this part of the code would run. So uh, we could take a look at if statement again, uh, the absolute value code again, but let's take a look at this first. So we have similar test case, except that we're checking if x is larger than five, else x is less than or equal to five. So if you pass in six, x is gonna be greater than five because six is larger than five, it goes into this statement and prints out um, this line. However, if we put in four, five or four, they are not larger than five. Therefore, it goes into the else statement and says x is less than or equal to five. Okay, and then let's take a let's re let's go back to absolute value. Take a look at it again. Uh, it should make more a little more sense. If as absolute value of five, it, if five is less than zero, which is not, it's going to go into go into the else statement and return just the number again. Uh, if it is less than five, well, it's, if it's less than zero, which is negative five, negative five, less than zero, that's true. Therefore, it's going to go into return negative X, which is going to tell you, get, uh, give you five. All right, uh, last bit, if else if statement. So sometimes you might want to chain a few conditions together. And that is when, um, that is when if else if statements comes in. So you can have if condition one is met, work this uh, and run this code. Else, if condition two is met, run this code. Else, if condition one and condition two does, is not met, well, if neither condition one or condition two is met, you go into the last statement. All right, so let's take a look at this piece of code. Um, first, we have test number six. So six is larger than five, it's gonna go in this, state, uh, this branch, saying X is greater than five. And then it's gonna check if x is equal to five. Well, and then it's gonna check if, no, oh, sorry. Um, then we, uh, so now let's look at the case where an x is five. X is not larger than five, therefore it's not gonna go in this statement. Five is not less than five, nor is it gonna go into this statement. Therefore, it's gonna, it's gonna end up in this statement, which is when x is equal to five because x is neither larger than five nor less than five, therefore it must be the same. It must be five. So five is printed. And then let's uh, check four. If x is larger than five, this is, well, four is not larger than five, this code doesn't run. Four is less than five, therefore this code is running. And it's gonna print out x is less than five. So now we have three different cases. And this is especially important. When uh, this if same is elf, if else if statement chaining together is rather important because sometimes you could eliminate the uh, writing redundant code. So let's take a look at this. Uh, let's say 
All right, let's do a simple grade calculation or stuff like that. Uh, plus, this is an example that I'd like to give. Uh, convert to letter. Uh, we have, uh, not awesome, public static one. Uh, let's do public static string. Is that like a turn number actually? Uh, let's give it a double uh, percentage rate. Going to shrink this a bit. All right, so what I wanted to do is have a code that does the following. If the grade is uh, uh, larger or equal to 90, then it's gonna uh, then a letter grade is assigned to A. If it's uh, between, if it's 80, or it's, if it's larger than or equal to 80, okay, well, I'm gonna do X. If 90 is larger than X and X is larger or equal to 80, then it's gonna give you B. There we go. I like to define this cases. Mm. And then we have 80 larger than X, larger than or equal to 70. That gives you a C. And then uh, 70, if 70 is larger than X, then you just fail, I guess. Well, we could do D, actually. There we go. So there are a few cases. And it's going to get rather complicated if I write them individually. Like, here's how I would write it. Uh, coming to letter one. If we have X, right? Uh, X is, well, we have 100 larger than or equal to X and X larger or, larger or equal to 90. Return A. If uh, copy this. Turn by X. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for reminding me that I should probably change this to X. Yeah, I'd rather change the percentage grade, but that's okay because it's just to make it a little more recognizable, but that's, that's fine. Uh, X. Return C. And then lastly, if 70 is larger than X, uh, return B. Oh my God, I'm missing semicolons all over the place. And lastly, let's just write a quick public static void. Uh, let's do a few cases like 93, well, 93. Int would work better in my case. I'm just gonna change it to int. Then we could do 83, 78. Oh, do 86. And then we could do a 60. There you go. Okay. Uh, it should work. Now let's see. Uh, So this should give you a, ooh, uh, what's going on here?
uh, Java C great calculator dot. Oh, I missing a. There we go. Oh, okay. Missing return statement. Return. For some reason, Java. Uh, yeah. So, in cases, as in some spe some magical case that none of this would work, you still have to have a backup. Um. Which actually I can just do this. Yeah, this is another way. Uh, because return statement ends the uh, method right away, so you could actually just have a trailing return statement over here. Yeah, anyways, it's not going to affect the uh, result. You have A, B, C, D. However, this gets a little rather complicated or messy. Uh, and then rather, if we do else if statements, uh, we could change it like this. Uh, I wish this is auto formatting, uh, which I don't think it does. That's fine. Uh, I'll just change this. Notice how I kind of just removed some of the lines over here. And that is because, well, I can do this because if X is larger than 90, it's already going to go into the first condition anyways. So I don't have to check it again. And uh, so I don't have to check it again over here. Same thing for this statement. I don't have to check it again, check again if it's less than 80, because I know that if it's greater than 80 or equal to 80, then it's always going to go into this statement. Same thing over here. I don't have to check again if it's less than 70, because I know that once it's above 70, it's going to go into one of these cases. So this is a, a rather easy way of just, I don't know if this is going to return another error so i'm just going to put it here just in case um so this is rather easy way of just having a return uh this. this is right yeah this is rather easy way of making your code looks uh simpler and making it run more efficiently uh that is also that is one important thing later on in our algorithms part which is the efficiency of the ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, what now? Method come is already defining class grade. Oh, my bad. There we go. Yeah, it is. Um, this is something that is important in our algorithm class just because, well, algorithm portion, that's the efficiency of the code. Over here, you're checking the code three or four times. Well, if this, this has another, if this had another statement of like, if X is less than 70, this would run four times. Well, this, uh, then the entire code is going to check four times. Uh, there we go. This, uh, there, it's going to check four different if statements. However, if you do if, else, if, else, if, else, then the code will only run enough times for it to process, well, for it to go into a certain branch. And once it does, it's no longer going to care about the other options. So that so if I have um, all A's, like if I have people with, uh, uh, if I call the function 80 times with the numbers like 93, 94, 97, 100, and like 98, then it, you're only going to check 100 times of 100 if statements. However, if I run uh, this version 100 times, then it's going to check 400, uh, 400 total if statements. That is four times, the, uh, that is the four times the efficiency loss. And that is rather important. Uh, in algorithms, uh, in doing uh, Java, uh, in doing algorithms, because you're trying to find a, you're trying to reduce the time of the task, uh, and make it run more efficiently, and just so this is one small optimization, which is just optimizations are just like making the code run more efficiently or run better, uh, and it's usually preferred to do these kind of chained together if statements. That's just a side note. And on that, we are 
that's I guess let's move on to the assignments real quick. I got three minutes. I'll make it quick. I promise. So we have a method that I wish I want you to write a method that calculates the weekly wage of an employee, and the method should take the input of number of hours worked. So like say um uh, per, per week like you know, uh like maybe fifty hours or sixty hours and the hourly wage which is going to be like how much you earn every hour. So let's say if I work 10 hours and have a wage of $10 per hour, I earn $100 total. And your task is to calculate this uh, total wage using a calculator, well, using your program. And here are a few rules. An employee gets paid hours times the rate, which is for each hour up to 40 hours. So uh, however, if the worker works more than 40 hours, they get overtime pay. And that is the hourly rate times 1.5 times the hours worked. So let's say if I worked 50 hours, I would get paid 40 hours worth of the hourly rate, and I will get an additional 10 hours worth of overtime. So that's going to be 1.5 the hourly rate times 10. And this hourly rate must be no less than the minimum wage in, well, where I live is Washington, Seattle. It's $15 an hour. Therefore, I'm going to set it like that. Um, you cannot have a minimum wage, wage, well, you cannot have a wage less than $15 an hour. If you do, then you have to print an error. And also, if the, work, if, if the employee is working more than 60 hours, then you also have to print an error message. And please name you your, so there are a few specifications. Please name your method, calculate wage. The input should be hours and wage, uh, or however you want to define it. Int is the amount, of, the amount of hours worked. Double is the hourly wage. And you should not app on anything, and so just print the results on the go. There are a few cases I wish you to test out. First is an employee who worked 50 hours at $9.99 an hour. Second, I want you to find the wage of an employee who works 50 hours or fifteen hours at $15 an hour. And lastly, it's 63 hours for $25 an hour. Uh, as, per, as per usual, do not have to submit it. Uh, just keep it. I'll post these solutions or, or my version of these solutions uh, a day before. And that being said, we are done with our class. If you have any questions, feel free to stay. If not, I wish you to have a good rest of the day and few days follow, I guess. If uh, if any uh, if you have any questions, uh, say and ask. If not, you could leave. See you guys next time. All right. Um if no any questions, if there's no questions, I'm gonna end the meeting. It is now six thirty one. Cool.